Oh, thank you very much, Linda. Can you all hear me out there? Okay. Um, it is a real pleasure to be here talking to you today. And I want to start with a brief discussion of the society. So as uh, Linda suggested, the society has changed uh, in the past several years, instituted a number of new initiatives, and I wanted to discuss this in the context of the society's history. And I'll argue that the goals and vision of the society have remained largely unchanged over time. But the lens through which we interpret these goals in this vision has been changed as the participation in the society has broadened. So the roots of the society are in the late 1930s when the fields of genetics, paleontology, and systematics realized, in fact, that they were not in conflict with one another. So that generated a lot of enthusiasm. Several groups got together to try to bring these ideas together. And unfortunately, at that time, people were so distracted with World War II that none of this really got off the ground. So in 1946, in the spring, at the end of the war, a group of scientists, evolutionary biologists, came together and had the first meeting for what they called the Society for the Study of Evolution. And then things came together quite quickly after that. Within the first year, they agreed that they were going to have a journal. It was called Evolution Then, called Evolution Now. And they held their first annual meeting. And a total of 500 people joined that first year. Now, back then, 500 people was a lot. OK, so what was the goals of that society when it formed? Well, the main one was the purpose of the society was to promote the study of organic evolution. And the society saw itself as a common meeting ground for representatives of all fields of science concerned with evolution. The journal that they agreed to publish was established to stimulate evolutionary research and provide a venue through which that research could be disseminated. And importantly, they committed to publish papers in that journal that represented a diversity of fields, organisms, and methods. And as I said, this was important because Ernst Meyer, who is a major figure in the sort of coalescing of the society, was said to favor experimental evolution. And then you had the people from the genetics background that favored model organisms. So coming to this broad agreement about the purpose of the journal was important. And then finally, they decided that the journal should be international. All right, so this is the society as it was originally conceived. However, the time was the 1940s. So at that point, participation was limited, largely to American and European white men. So vision similar, participants different, or you'll see. So what do we do now? Here is a list of activities that the society supports that I've just taken directly off of the website. And the question is, to what extent does this reflect that initial vision of the society? And that is to promote the study of evolution. Well, now. I'd say we promote the study of evolution by supporting two journals, this meeting, sponsoring symposia. We support the training of graduate students, so that is our next generation of evolutionary biologists. 
We recognize scientific advances in evolution. We recognize outreach, and that is the bringing of evolutionary ideas to the public. Um, so these are all ways that we now promote the study of evolution. The second goal of the society at its beginning was to create a common meeting ground for people interested in evolution. And I would say now we interpret this phrase, common meeting ground, as creating community. And we create a community for evolutionary biologists, again, through this meeting that we're at now, through the Graduate Council, and we also have undertaken activities to welcome people to the field of evolutionary biology. Oops, drats, I wonder if you go backwards. There we go. Um, to the field of evolutionary biology. And we have undertaken activities to facilitate the participation in uh, the field of evolution. So we still, as the initial society, um, support people who work in a diversity of fields, organisms, and methods. And to that, I would add, we also support a diversity of people. Okay, so as things, have things changed? As you can tell, I think that largely our mission has remained very constant over time, to promote evolution and to provide a common meeting ground. However, the lens through which we interpret these goals has changed as the world around us has changed. And I'm gonna to return to this idea later in my talk that the questions that we ask, the ideas that we test um, may be very constant over time, but how we approach them changes as the world around us changes. Okay, with that, I now want to turn to the science part of my talk. So as I was pulling together this history of the society, I began to reflect a little bit on my history as a scientist. And I realized that the way I approach ideas and ask questions, in fact, sort of the motivation has changed some over my career. And so I am going to reflect on that a little bit today. So in order to get there, we've got to go to the beginning of my independent, my career as an independent scientist. And that was, as Linda may have said, in 1996, I got a job at the University of Virginia. I was so excited. I had all these ideas I wanted to test, theories to test, and um, I just needed a system to test them in. So I was looking for something to work on near Mount Lake Biological Station, um, which is associated with the University of Virginia. So I go out into the woods and I find this stunning little plant here. This is Campanula Americana or American Bellflower. It had a life history that was very appropriate to the questions that I wanted to test. So I thought, okay, here I go. And at that point, I had no idea that 25 years later, this plant would still have so much to teach me. So about the first half of my career, I was largely a field biologist working out in natural populations, doing um, manipulative experiments, um, to using quantitative and ecological genetic methods to test mostly ideas on maternal effects, as Linda said. So I took the maternal effects, to what extent do they influence fitness, evolution, so I took the standard approach that I learned as a graduate student that I think we all teach our graduate students, and that is I started with theory, 
use that to develop hypotheses, experiments to test those hypotheses, and then finally the results of those experiments to draw conclusions that shed light on theories. And I learned a lot from this approach. However, there were some observations I had that just didn't fit in. And one of these observations is these white seedlings. The presence of those white seedlings, they just didn't make sense in light of the work that I was doing. All right, so the story of the white seedlings starts with none other than Linda Delph here, who had invited me for a seminar at Indiana University. We went out for a walk in the woods, and we encountered good old Campanula. She said, oh, you must take them home with you. So we dug some up, and I go home with a plastic bag of plants and the airplane, and then get back to Virginia, grow them in the greenhouse, and for reasons that have long since fallen to the side, I created a number of hybrids between these Virginia plants and, uh, sorry, between these Indiana plants and plants from Virginia collected near Mountain Lake Biological Station. So I had these between population hybrids. I grew them up, and that's where the white seedlings come from, or technically they're called chlorotic seedlings. And I was really surprised to see these chlorotic seedlings. Plants from Virginia and Indiana, they look the same. They had basically the same life history, the same phenology. The climate is really similar. There was sort of no reason ahead of time for me to expect this kind of reproductive isolation. So I just uh, kind of mentally filed it under weird. Um, at the time, recently, Lynch and Force had come out with this paper that suggested gene duplications increase the probability of reproductive isolation. This species is an autotetraploid, a lot of gene duplications. I thought, maybe that's what's going on. I didn't know. So as I said, weird. Took me a little while to get back to it, but I finally did. I decided I wanted to dig in and figure out what was going on here. So I grew a number of populations from across the range, and I wanted to ask, how common is this kind of reproductive isolation in crosses between populations? Is this a one-off? Is it common? What's the spatial scale? I just didn't know anything about it. And at that time, I was lucky that Karen Barnard Cubot had just joined the lab as a PhD student. She uh, joined me in this project, or maybe I should say, I joined her in the project starting at that point. And we made all these crosses, and I should say at this point, we were unencumbered by any genetic information on differentiation between populations. Yeah, when you're dealing with an autotetraploid back then, there wasn't a lot of options. So we just used the good old isolation by distance concept and cross populations a range of distances from one another and uh, grew the seedlings. Many of them were happy green plants, but some of them were chlorotic with non-functional chloroplast. Others were light green, yellowish, presumably with partially functional chloroplasts. They lived a bit longer. And still, we had a few oddballs, too, that were variegated. So the question is, what determines whether these seedlings germinated green or white? Well, Karen pulled together a number of chloroplast SNPs and developed this phylogeny. And here I've just color-coded the three main clades um, to make them easy to see. These clades were geographically structured with the most ancestral in the Appalachian Mountains, a small clade to the east, and quite a large clade to the west of the Appalachians and in the southern mountains. And these genetics illuminated 
the results we got in the greenhouse. Basically, every time the crosses were within a chloroplast lineage, the seedlings were green, didn't matter which lineage. Every time the crosses were between chloroplast lineages, they were white, yellow, whatever. Didn't matter which two lineages we were crossing. The other thing we found is that response to the hybrids were asymmetric. Hybrids that had an Appalachian mom were green. Hybrids that had a Western or more derived mom were chlorotic um, or had um, some kind of chloroplast um, deviation. So uh, chloroplasts are typically maternally inherited, so finding this asymmetry and the um, color variation suggested that um, there was a non, not a problem with creating the chloroplasts. Okay, so as I said, we did a number of crosses. This is putting them all together, and I have color-coded the reciprocal crosses with the um, maternal plant, the maternal lineage or the cytoplasm. And what you can see is that crosses that had a Western mother showed a reduction in survival relative to within population crosses. And sometimes this production, reduction in survival was high. Here we have up to an 80% reduction in survival in these between population crosses relative to within population crosses. 80%, that's a lot. And the greater the differentiation between the chloroplast genomes, the greater the reproductive isolation. All right, so next we can ask, why are these seedlings white? As I indicated, this is uh, due to a non-functional chloroplast, and basically chloroplast development and function requires genes in the chloroplast genome, genes in the nuclear genome, products of these genes cooperate to build and work a chloroplast. So the minute you see chloroplasts that aren't functioning properly tells you there's been one of these partners has evolved, which is breaking down the cooperation. And typically, we think that it is the chloroplast that evolves because chloroplast genomes are haploid. So, or, sorry, typically we think it's the chloroplast that drives this process. That's what I meant to say. Because chloroplast genomes are haploid, so any mutation is going to be expressed. And in addition, uh, recombination is quite limited, and chloroplasts have a small effective population size. Okay, so we think that they're the drivers. So the idea is that there is a mutation in the chloroplast genome, that requires a compensatory mutation in the nuclear genome in order to have chloroplast function. So I think you can see here that if you cross between lineages, you're going to have a mutant chloroplast that doesn't have the um, nuclear gene with the compensatory mutation in this lineage. Hence, we get this isolation. All right, so the idea that chloroplasts are evolving, driving this isolation, got Karen thinking, what does chloroplast evolution look like in this species? And what this figure on the left does is it shows you patterns of, um, it shows you that there is high rates of non-synonymous substitution in Campanula americana chloroplasts relative to other species. And this shows up particularly in genes that are less constrained by function. And then interestingly, a number of these same genes also show high rates of chloroplast evolution within the species. And that's what we see on this axis. So together, this tells us that this species has 
evolution, what I call evolutionarily active chloroplasts, so relatively high rates of chloroplast evolution. Okay, so in chasing down this observation that some seedlings are white, what did we learn? We learned that there is substantial incompatibility that is asymmetric and it is expressed in F1 hybrids between chloroplast lineages. And that the chloroplast evolves relatively rapidly. All right, that's a summary of the results. What is the big picture? Why do we care? What's the conceptual advance associated with this? Well, first we found that there is cytonuclear incompatibility driven by this active chloroplast genome. And then secondly, this incompatibility is large, right? 80% reduction in survival in F1s. That is more than between many plant species. And so you might say, huh, is this a case of incipient speciation? Well, I'd argue that actually it's kind of a crappy example of speciation because you have lots of isolation, but it's only in one direction. Gene flow is not impeded at all in the other direction. And at first I thought, well, okay, that's not so great. And then I started thinking about it and I realized 80% reduction in fitness, that is a lot. You're gonna get selection for prezygotic isolation in order to avoid those fitness reductions. And then these prezygotic isolation traits, for example, shifts in flowering time, are going to be symmetric. And so very likely what we have is a situation where high amounts of cytonuclear isolation wind up driving the evolution of prezygotic isolation, which is more robust in terms of an isolating mechanism. Um, so I guess I'm saying that I see cytonuclear isolation is really potentially sort of the first step in this process of speciation. All right, secondly, we found that the chloroplast genome evolves rapidly. Well, chloroplast genomes are typically quite conservative in their evolution. In this species, actually the whole Campanula family, and there's a couple of other plant families that show rapid rates of chloroplast evolution. And so that just got me wondering whether the potential for speciation is in fact higher in some plant families than others. I would be remiss if I didn't say that we are following up on this now, um, but that's actually a topic for a different talk. What I wanna do now is move to observation number two, the variegated leaves that I showed you earlier. And you should realize that these don't quite sync with what I told you about a minute ago, that we have green seedlings that have Appalachian, green hybrids that have Appalachian chloroplast, white hybrids that have Western chloroplast. How do we get this? How do we get both green and white on the same plant? I will say that it took me an embarrassingly long time to ask this question, but I did. And what we found was by taking variegated hybrids, collecting tissue from the green parts, tissue from the white parts, and genotyping it, we learned that white tissue always has a western chloroplast, green tissue has an Appalachian chloroplast, and so this tells you that this plant here has inherited chloroplast from both parents. It's a hybrid between Appalachian and Western. It's got both chloroplasts. So there is biparental plastid inheritance. And so Karen and I wondered how common is this to find biparental plastid inheritance? And at this point, we had a number of crosses between populations, and so we just ground up seedlings to see what the chloroplast inheritance looks like. Oops. 
And you can see those results here. Um, this is results for one cross. Chloroplast inheritance is largely maternal, so most individuals have strictly maternal chloroplast inheritance. However, a few individuals have strictly paternal chloroplast inheritance, and then a number have something in between. And as I said, this is one cross. We developed histograms like this for all the crosses that we did. And what we found was chloroplast inheritance was always biparental. Whether the cross led to incompatibility or if the cross led to green seedlings. The other thing about this biparental inheritance was that it was associated with the degree of incompatibility. So here we have um, biparental inheritance on this axis, more biparental inheritance down here, and then this is F1 survival if you've got an incompatible plastid. So when survival with an incompatible plastid was low, probably because the seedlings were white, there was large degrees of biparental inheritance, meaning a lot of that compatible paternal chloroplast was inherited. So this leads to the situation where survival, uh, low survival in the F1 is associated with a recovery or a rebound in survival of the F2 because most of these survivors have the paternal chloroplast. All right, so by chasing down this observation of variegated leaves, what did we learn? We learned that chloroplast inheritance is biparental, but also that biparental inheritance allows for the survival of hybrids that otherwise would be inviable. So what's the big picture here? Well, biparental inheritance provides an escape from cytonuclear incompatibility. An escape from incompatibility, what does that mean? Well, if you think about it, this is kind of a mechanism of species cohesion, right? We have deep genetic differences between these chloroplast lineages. They lead to incompatibility, and yet this biparental inheritance provides a way to get around that incompatibility. And even more than that, this um, biparental inheritance appears to evolve in response to incompatibility, right? So suggesting this mechanism of circumventing the incompatibility is evolving with it. Again, sounding like a mechanism of species cohesion. Secondly, organelle inheritance, whether we're talking about chloroplast or mitochondria, um, maternal inheritance is ubiquitous. Here we've got biparental chloroplast inheritance. The question is, why? Well, in order to understand why, it's easier to start with why is uniparental inheritance so common? And there's two main theories. One is that it provides a mechanism to alleviate genomic conflict, in other words, to get around selfish organelles. Secondly, it provides a mechanism, or as I've said here, an escape from um, cytonuclear incompatibility. Largely, these two theories have not been tested, though they've been around for a long time. And I would argue that this is probably because uniparental inheritance is so ubiquitous that it's hard to figure out how to test it. But I would say here, because we have the, a species where um, there's biparental inheritance both when there is incompatibility and when there is not incompatibility, it gives us a vehicle to test these hypo this hypothesis. All right, observation number three. At this point, Karen and I had spent a lot of time in the greenhouse. And each of us had independently noted 
that some plants seemed to make fruits without pollinators and others didn't. And in the world of plant mating systems, the ability to make fruits without pollinators is called autonomous selfing. And now uh, Matt Kosky is um, joined me in order to chase down this observation. Do, does this happen that some plants make fruits without pollinators? And the first thing we did was just quantify this and found that yes, indeed, some populations have low rates of autonomous selfing, about 30%. And in other populations, the ability to make fruits without pollinators is a lot higher, up to 80%. And then unexpectedly, this difference was geographically structured. So here, yellow are plants that have low selfing potential, red, high selfing potential. And I think you can see pretty clearly that the further north and further west populations are, the more fruits they can make without pollinators. Of course, the question is, why? Well, enter Jeremiah Bush, and together with Dina Grossenbacher and Liao Kuo, we set out to try to answer this question. When um, plant biologists think about mating system variation, we often look for local ecological factors that drive variation in mating system, for example, pollinator abundance. So we go out to 24 populations and we score pollinator abundance, we manipulate flowers, we collect fruits, and after all that we find that ecological drivers are not associated with anything we measured. And basically this list here is a go-to for plant reproductive biologists of why we find mating system variation. So if it's not this, what is it? Well, genetics to the rescue again. So Jeremiah undertook rad seek analysis, and um, what he found was that Western populations, and I should say these are 24 populations in the Western clade, Western populations have expanded from a mid-latitude refugia after the last glaciation. So they expanded from this refugia, and in fact, there is a second Western refugia that they also expanded from. So then we just tr uh, measured the distance from this refugia to each of these populations. So this represents the colonization distance. Um, and we found, not surprisingly, that genetic diversity was tightly associated with colonization distance, such that the further populations had gone to colonize, the smaller um, the genetic diversity, presumably due to founder effects, um, genetic drift, limited population size. Um, but what we were not expecting is that the ability to self without a pollinator was also strongly associated with colonization distance. And I think you can see pretty clearly that populations that had Coloni longer colonization distances set many more fruits without pollinators. All right, so what did we learn by chasing down this observation that some plants make more fruits without pollinators than others? First, we found there's a geographic pattern in selfing ability, and that pattern is not due to the expected contemporary ecological drivers, but rather it's associated with historic patterns of colonization. And now what's the big picture take-homes from this? 
first place that phenotypic differentiation among populations may be driven by history, a population's history, rather than contemporary factors. And this is true even for traits like mating system that we consider adaptive and to be structured by or, um, uh, selection to act local, to be acted on by local selection. Secondly, we found that there were large-scale geographic patterns, both of genetic variation and of phenotype, and these geographic patterns then provide a context for ongoing and future evolution. So what we have here is a case where a population's history influences its evolutionary potential. And I would argue that this take home is likely to be common to all temperate plants. Anything that has expanded from a glacial refugia, those populations are going to carry with them Pa um, a history associated with that colonization. Of course, you'll might note that I didn't actually answer this question of why, oops, of why there is greater selfing potential further from the glacial refugia. It is quite possibly be simply because selfers are better colonists because they don't need a mate in order to be able to reproduce. In the world of plants, this is called Baker's Law, and my student Hannah Mikowski is working on this now for her PhD. Okay, last observation. In fact, this is not an observation uh, as much as Taking, going back to some results that I've showed you in the last couple of minutes. And the first one is that I said that this western clade has expanded from a mid-latitude refugia. And secondly, this is the chloroplast phylogeny. Instead of showing you all in one color, I've indicated the haplotypes by different colors. And I am only showing you the western clade here. And in this chloroplast phylogeny, you can see that this basal haplotype is white, shown here. And this white haplotype is found in the southern Appalachians and also along the southern margin. From the south, the colonization north happened to the west of the Mississippi, as indicated by this branch, and then to the east of the Mississippi by this branch. All right, so what these genetic results, uh, so, so in the sort of center and northern parts of the range, the genetic results are very congruent. Whereas in the southern parts of the range, they suggest a different story. Here, that the southern populations are derived. Here, that they're basal. And that got me thinking, who are these rear edge populations anyway? So in a species range, the rear edge is that closest to the glacial refugia in the northern hemisphere that's in the south. And while people have done a lot of work studying the leading edge of ranges furthest from the glacial refugia, there has been a lot less uh, work trying to understand what's happening at the rear edge. And so I'm taking this on with the uh, team of Antoine Perrier, who is going to talk about the first bit of results from this on Tuesday, and Jeremiah Bush. I think that's all I want to say. Okay, so here is a stylized species range, 
And you can see the rear edge is indicated here by isolated populations. And these uh, represent the results I've just shown you, suggesting these isolated populations have are basal persisting since the last glaciation, or perhaps persisting over several glacial, different glacial cycles, or represent secondary colonization. Another possibility is it's not or, it's and. And that suggests that these rear edge populations are genetically really heterogeneous. So this is a spatial distribution model for Campanula americana. It fits the distribution of the species really well in the south. My uh, graduate student, Carrick Lamb, put this together. And what you can see is that these southern populations are much patchier. So the idea that there are isolated populations, maybe smaller, less gene flow, genetic drift, less variation, more differentiation among them, those would all be sort of characteristics expected of rear edge populations. But also note that these rear edge populations are in less suitable habitats. In fact, these um, areas are substantially warmer than the rest of the range. So they may be under unique selective pressures by these warmer environments. So the story stops here because this is work in progress. And so instead of providing you results, I'm going to provide you of hypotheses that this observation, that we don't know who these rear edge populations are, brings up. So the first, hypotheses, it, first hypothesis is that spatial patterns of genetic variation and genetic differentiation may depend on range location. Secondly, and this relates to something I've talked about earlier, population history may affect adaptive potential. And then last, over evolutionary time, the rear edge has repeatedly served as the source of post-glacial colonization. So it has served as the source of genetic variation present in many species. And I would argue that right now, that rear edge is in a warmer habitat. And so local adaptation to these warmer environments may yet again provide a source of genetic diversity that is important in adaptation um, for this uh, species as a whole. All right, so with that, that is the end of the stories of Campanula americana. And I want to wrap this up with a couple of take home questions. So questions that have come out of doing this work. First place, are there attributes of taxa that make speciation more likely. For example, having an evolutionarily active chloroplast. Secondly, why is uniparental inheritance so prevalent? And I'd argue the place to start looking for an answer is by taking a species that breaks this mold, like Campanula. And then third, how do historic factors shape contemporary genetic and phenotypic patterns and thereby provide a context for future evolution? So I started off saying that the first half of my career as an independent scientist I started with theory, developed hypotheses and experiments, and used the results to um, develop conclusions and illuminate theory. And I realized that I was putting, as I was putting this together, that in the second half of my career, I've pretty much done a 180. Whereas here, I've started with observations. 
I've used those observations to develop experiments, and then I have interpreted those experiments in a way that sheds light on theory. And I'm presenting this to you because I want to urge you to just keep your mind open about how you approach scientific questions. And then a few more take-home messages. First, as I have just suggested, as you do your science, keep your eyes and your mind open. Some of the most, some just little observations can wind up yielding some of the most interesting results. And then secondly, what I did was starting with an observation, did an experiment, got some results. And then it was my job as a scientist to figure out what the big picture importance of those results are. Why do they matter? How do they relate to theory? Why should people care about them? Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, uh, maybe I'm just lucky, right? Um, may I've took these sort of uh, random seeming observations and came up with results that illuminated important evolutionary theories, right? Maybe that's just lucky. Maybe. On the other hand, it makes me think of Ellen Ketterson's description of her study system as the ordinary, extraordinary junko. And I would argue that within many study systems, there are extraordinary results. You just have to keep your eyes open and see them. And then finally, and this is where I want to go back to my earlier discussion of the Society for the Study of Evolution. Um, um, sorry. Uh, as evolutionary biologists, a lot of the ideas that we test have been around forever, right? The big questions, the concepts, they are out there. But just as with SSE, as we learn more about the world, or with SSE, as the world changes, the lens through which we interpret these questions and what we can learn from them changes. So you can go out and chase down this same idea and get a very different answer because our understanding of the world is different. And so I encourage you, don't get, as I say, bogged down in worrying that something has already been done because um, there is a lot new to learn about old ideas. And the way that I've done it has been chasing down these observations, and I would encourage you to find your own observations or theories and chase them down. And now, before I finish, I just want to thank you all for the privilege of serving the society and to acknowledge all of the many people that work together and make the society function and do all the wonderful things that we do. And I want to acknowledge my lab and all of the people that have helped participate in this campaign work that I've talked about. Thank you. No so Linda says there's no time for questions. So. Um, the next uh, meeting is Hamilton in here, Hamilton in here, or off to your talks. Thank you very much. <laughs>